right, so welcome back, everyone. Welcome to week three. Congratulations and Gold Star for making it this far. Um, and uh, if you do make it all the way to the end of the session, we've got a very special downloadable gift for you. So please do hang in there to the end. Um, I'm Sonia Zamborski. I'm the Communications Director and DEI Lead for Sustainability Matters and one of your presenters for this series. And in case you missed it during one of our last two sessions, I want to just give a quick intro about Sustainability Matters. Um, we are small but mighty, and we cultivate community through conservation. Our focus is giving individuals, farmers, businesses, the tools they need to really make a difference in the environment without having to wait for the government to make a change or wait for some big business to do something. We really focus on practical education for everybody. And our goal is to make sustainability fun, realistic, and inclusive of all. And hopefully we've been doing that for this for your dinner session so far. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we're a four-year-old nonprofit based in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia. And um, in the before times, we did mostly in-person events in that area. And since the pandemic, like most groups, we've pivoted and we're doing these lovely webinars for our global audience. And most of our folks are, are from the US, but we do get people dialing in from far fun places as we're seeing in the chat. And we, we welcome you, give you a special welcome. The information that we've been providing and that we'll continue to provide today is, is meant to be pretty broad. And um, you know, we'll we'll do as our best to answer your questions, but keep in mind that we may not get to every specific concern that you have. Um, we do invite you to join us on Facebook to keep the conversation going. Um, and also keep in mind that we really have, have been trying to target this towards the beginner and low income and food secure households. So the information has been, you know, pretty basic, but hopefully helpful for everyone. And again, we're gonna to try to get to lots of your questions today. I know that some of you have been holding them for, for this past two sessions. So this will be your chance to let it all fly. So um, with that, I'm gonna <laughs> hand it over to KT, who once again is leading our fabulous Zoom team for a little bit of housekeeping. Thank you, Sonia. Um, as uh, Sonia said, I'm, I'm leading up our Zoom team. And so we are here to help out with technical things and also to keep a conversation going. So, um, just as a reminder for those of you who've been here for all of our sessions or uh, some new information for those of you who've just joined us this time, um, we are keeping all of uh, the, all of you who are attending will be muted and we cannot see your lovely faces either. So you will only be able to see the presenters and the Zoom team and we'll, we're the only ones who can talk. So rather than raising your hand, if you have a question, the best thing to do is to use the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and it's got what look like little uh, conversation bubbles attached to it. If you just wanna chat, many of you have already found the chat space and the Zoom team will be uh, monitoring both of those, the chat and the Q&A. We'll be highlighting things to ask of our wonderful presenters in person. And we also may be answering things as we can to go along so that you're not holding out too, too long uh, to get to your answers um, about things like pests, which is finally today. So. Um, I think that if you've got any other questions, just let us know about what's going on. Uh, we're also happy to have our friends on Facebook. Um, and if you are watching on Facebook, you can leave a comment on the Facebook uh, live item and we will also answer those um, either via the comments or to our presenters um, as we go along. So thank you so much. I'll give it back to Sonia. All right. Thanks, Katie. So we're going to start with a quick recap um, of session two which went through a lot of types of gardens, soil, structure, why, why you would have gardens in different, different formats, seed starting, labeling a little bit about protection from the elements, and we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, this time in terms of, of uh, other things that might attack your plants. Um, so it would be great if you are, uh, if you'd like to share, tell us in, in chat, what was the most useful thing that you learned from either from last week or from the last two weeks? We just really love to hear what's been resonating with folks and what really stood out for you. So feel free to pop that into chat as we go. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Paula. Thank you, Sonia. It's a real pleasure to be with you once again. And today uh, we are going to tackle together some of our garden challenges. And just from the questions from the last two times, I think many of you are already uh, looking ahead. Um, so as an introduction, we are going to talk about weeds, about insect pests and other pests, and plant diseases. 
I'm going to start with weeds because actually here it is March and already the weeds are starting to grow. I notice in my own garden so that um, it's, it's time to, to seriously prowl your garden and look and see what is actually going on. A little later on, you may find that as your plants are coming up, something or other is eating some of the leaves of some of your plants. Yes, those are the insect pests. And alas, even a little later on, maybe, maybe by May, uh, some plants might start looking a little sick and then diseases are getting in. So we need to deal with them and we're going to do our very best to help you uh, minimize the challenges there. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with weeds. Can I have the next slide, please? There may be a delay, but that's, it's showing up on my screen, so hopefully you'll see it well, soon. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. So what are weeds? Of course, we know it's a plant that's in the wrong place, but it's more than that. Um, because weeds actually we don't like, and why don't we like them? Because they are strong plants and they compete aggressively for moisture and for nutrients from the plants that you do want to grow. However, it's so interesting to me that it's actually only about 3% of all the plant species that we actually call, we humans call weeds. So the first principle about weeds is it's way better if you can get them when they're young before they really put down those roots and formed mats of weeds where it's so much harder work. But we'll talk about how to get to deal with those too. Um, but if you can get your weeds young, that's the time. And this March is the time to start looking and dealing with it now. However, it is important to notice that you can forage among some of your weeds. Uh, some are edible and my very favorite is actually wintercress. Some people call it bittercress. I don't know why, because I don't think it's bitter at all. It tastes like watercress to me. And this little plot, this uh, picture here is of the um, wintercress. Uh, it doesn't quite show you the beautiful rosette, the sort of fan shaped rosette of green leaves that it forms, quite small, maybe the size of the palm of your hand and they'll be tucked all around your garden. I go out every, every single day. We have some chopped up, cleaned <laughs> uh, wintercress in our salads. It's a, a very nice addition. Chickweed will be coming along soon. I haven't seen any in my garden quite yet. Wild violets, and you can eat the flowers as well as the leaves. And a lot, quite a bit later on, maybe June, uh, purslane will appear. And that's particularly good because it's, it's um, full of vitamin C, very good uh, wild uh, weed for us. Next slide, please. I'm not sure how I can indicate that I'm ready because <laughs> I want to go on and start talking about tools. I'm starting with tools for weeding because it does make a difference. I see the slide up here for that. I think the slide is up here for use, useful tools for weeding, it says. That's right. Yes, it is now. Thank you. So if you are gardening just in um, raised beds and in containers, pots, then you are lucky because you probably won't be uh, too troubled with large weeds and small hand tools probably will do the job for you. Depends how many raised beds you have and whether you have large ones and then you might need uh, the, long, the larger tools. But uh, it's rather nice, particularly in the pots, um, you really don't have to deal with weeds. However, many of us I know, I have in-ground gardens and I want to tell you a little bit about some of the tools that actually really make the job a lot easier. I do have to admit that I did not buy new tools when I started out gardening many, many years ago. Um, I sort of got them at auctions or uh, giveaways and some people would give me things. Um, and 
people would move and leave me something. So, and that was fine. However, over the years, I've discovered there are some really, really good tools. And I'm going to start with hoes. Now this hoe on the right is um, a hoe uh, that is called an oscillating hoe because actually this, um, I don't think you can see my cursor, this, this tool at the bottom uh, wobbles back and forth. And the reason for that is that you can have a to and fro motion along uh, just underneath the surface of the soil, clipping off young weeds very aggressively and very effectively and very quickly. Uh, it's a very nice hoe. And that's quite an admission for me because I always swore by what they call the English hoe, which is a flat plate with a hole in the middle and it works pretty well. Um, but this one, the oscillation uh, motion is, oh my goodness me, it does get the, the weeds very well. So this works well if the soil is not full of stones and clods, if it's fairly good, but you've got small young weeds. At this time of year, for you, those of you with an in-ground garden, go out with your hoe and whatever kind of hoe you have, because you go just underneath the surface of the soil and you clip off those roots and you can just leave them there because they'll soon wither and die uh, at, this, at this time of year. I would ask, can you get me two um, slides on just for a moment because there's a picture I'd like to show two slides on or is that too difficult? Uh, no, I think it's another one. One more on. Oops. Oh, that's, well, that's, that's, not, that's not the picture I expected. Well, uh, this is not a very good hoe, actually. There, that's the one I want. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. This is the oscillating hoe in action, so to speak. You can see there's a relatively small weed there. The, oopsie. <laughs> I don't know quite what's happening here. Sorry, um, that was my fault. <laughs> We shouldn't have that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well. Anyway, th this this is the ho this is another oscillating hoe, and you can see it's just going to go, and it's going to nip that particular uh, green weed on the right. It's going to nip it right off and cut it right off at the root, and it's going to be dead. And it's really wonderful. I'm so sorry. Now we're going to have to ask you to go back to. Um, uh, two slides back. I think I'm making it a little complicated for my wonderful Zoom team, but um, I wanted to show you the picture of the oscillating hoe in action. Not very many people know about these, and it was quite an admission for me to say that it was better than the English hoe, as you can imagine. Diggers. Now, not all weeds, even in March, are you going to be able to get at with a hoe. For example, the dandelion, as we all know, I think, beautiful yellow flower, actually a pollinator, but oh dear, that tap root goes down forever. And the wild onions are probably my particular pest that I dislike because they have, uh, they, they develop their bulbs and little bulbets way down, a couple of inches down below the so surface. And if you miss any, oh, you'll have a crop of wild onions in no time, quite a nuisance. The digger is a hand tool uh, with a, a, a metal rod with a little prong at the end and you just dig it as, as you would a trowel or something like that. Very effective. And I now want to say if however, and it does happen to us all, the weeds do get away from you, you're just too busy to do the weeding when it's their babies, they got big, they form mats, and oh my goodness me, they are engulfing your onion, uh, onion patch and onions do not like weeds. They, they do not like to be competed uh, by, by, by them. So then I really recommend something called the mattock. Um, it is nothing more than a fairly lightweight pickaxe. Next slide, please. There it is bottom. The bottom, that's on a long handle with a flat blade and a pointy blade. And you can swing it. It's fairly heavy. It's very sturdy. You can swing it at that mat of, 
uh, with the flat blade and you can just chop them off right underneath the surface, maybe three inches down in the soil. Very effective. It's a very, very good. Uh, I actually have two mattocks. I have a rather heavy one when I'm really in trouble and um, a, a lighter one, which I use all the time. Since we're talking about tools, I decided I would put in this, um, this slide about and talk a little bit about other tools, which for one reason or another, I think you might be interested in. Many of them you know about, but some of them you may not. Well, we're all going to be planting, I trust. Uh, if not, you, if you haven't started yet, you soon will be. And uh, the first thing you will be doing is you'll be uh, thinking about seeds outside and you want to rake your bed for the seed bed so that the soil is relatively fine. You don't want great rocks and clods of a clay earth on the, foot, on the surface and a rake is very useful. I might mention that though um, rakes tend to come fairly large, I have a small rake which I find very easily maneuvered and I like that too. Uh, for planting there's nothing like a sturdy trowel and trowels are very easy to come by secondhand or giveaways. And then the third thing I've got here, some of you may not have heard of, and it's really useful for planting. Uh, if you have an electric drill in the house, um, my husband has a couple of them, um, I have purchased an auger, which is a, a, a fairly large diameter spiral, which will cut through the soil with the electric, with the power of the electric drill, so that I'm not doing it by hand. And the, the auger probably has a diameter of maybe three inches. And you, and provided again, you don't have a lot of rocks because it can spin those rocks out of the soil. But if you have a decent bed, supposing for example, you were going to plant a couple, uh, half a dozen tomato plants, you've got them all ready to go in the ground and you've got to make six holes. Well, you can, of course you can do it with your trowel, but you do it with your electric drill with the auger and it's done in two minutes. It's just a lovely, uh, lovely uh, little tool. And of course, they're actually sold, these augers, you can get them in the hardware store. Uh, they're sold to plant bulbs. So if you're thinking in the fall, you want to plant spring bulbs, Maybe you want to plant a hundred daffodils or something. That is a very, very hard job to do. With the drill, the holes are drilled in no time at all and it's, it's really quite delightful. So I recommend that. What else are you going to do with tools? Pruning and snipping. Pruners, it's probably worthwhile trying to get a decent pruner, if only because the steel will be good quality and perhaps will hold the edge before going very dull. I have an awful time keeping uh, pruners sharp, even though I really try not to strain them and put them on wood that's too hard or too big. Um, so if you can, but if you can't, you just get whatever pruner you can and then learn how to sharpen it. Um, there are two kinds of pruners. There's the ones that I think we're most familiar with called bypass pruners because they have two sharp blades that bypass each other and these are perfect for fairly soft wood, greenish wood and uh, something that will cut relatively easily. The anvil pruner is differently designed. It has one sharp blade and then it has a flattish surface and it really semi crushes. It's very much stronger and you can use it for dead twigs and you can use it for hard uh, twigs again. Uh, the, the temptation is always to see, could you just go to that slightly bigger piece of limb there, but really one shouldn't, but I, I do sometimes. But at least if you've got the anvil, um, it, it won't, it, it, you know, it, it can do the job. Snips, I don't think it's worth spending a lot of money on those. And I have discovered that the dollar type stores sometimes at this time of year, or maybe in another month or so, have them for a dollar each and they are very handy and you can slip them in your pocket. And then that's one when you want to snip off um, leaves from a, a cabbage that's been, a, a larvae of a, a cabbage white has got at it and you've got big holes in it, you don't you want to get rid of that leaf. 
the snips are very useful. As I say, you can put it in your pocket and you can, as you're prowling the garden, you've got it handy all the time. Or you can snip your herbs, you can bring them in for supper or whatever. Digging and harvesting. And uh, I love the garden fork. That is the illustration up on the right hand side at the top. Um, that is a, a long handled, fairly long handled fork. Sturdy tines at the end typically it has four tines. Um, very useful for digging big roots and shrubs even um, because unlike a spade, it doesn't slice the root in places you don't want. And it tends to, to move down into the soil more easily than perhaps a spade does. Now, sometimes you need a spade, but I find I use the fork two to three times more often than I use a spade. The compost fork might look quite like this. It might even have five or six tines, but they will be slender and the very lightweight. The point with the compost fork is to be able to uh, get a good load of compost or mulch or something that would kind of cling together and a uh, straw, uh, very much, very useful. And it will give you a nice mound and the whole thing will be light enough that you're not hurting your shoulders as you're moving the compost. And of course, compost has to be stirred from time to time and a compost fork is very nice indeed. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about handling the weeds. Um, if, uh, if you have in fact finished, um, uh, finished uh, weeding or you think you've done as much as you want to do, uh, what are you going to do with what, what you've got left? It looks beautiful after you've finished weeding. You've got a nice soil surface, you're ready to plant. However, what you have done in, in doing that weeding, even with a hoe, you've deserved, you have stirred up a weed seed bed. All those lovely seeds of weeds are underneath the surface and you've stirred them up. If you leave them on the top, which of course we often do, um, then you're just going to have to keep on hoeing them because they're going to sprout. The other way to do it, deal with it, is to um, suppress uh, any tendency for these weeds to grow. And there are other reasons that it's rather good to do this um, mulching. Um, and I personally really like layers of wet newspaper, maybe eight to 10 sheets of newspaper um, along the row or in the, in, in the raised bed. I have some raised beds where I use this. And then I put mulch, sometimes I put straw, sometimes I put chopped up brown leaves, or compost on top of the, in a thin layer, not more than an inch, you don't need very much. And then that is sufficient to suppress further weed growth. And I'm very proud to say that for the first time this last fall into October, I had hardly done any weeding in my entire vegetable garden because I had got everything so thoroughly covered in newspaper and cardboard and, and uh, mulch and everything did well. I was not uh, plagued by slugs. Sometimes if you just put mulch down, uh, you can get quite a crop of slugs. But I think putting the newspaper down first is quite helpful. Here is a real, really strong warning from us all. Please don't use herbicides around edibles. Herbicides, of course, have, are toxic. They're toxic to humans. We don't know how much will get into your plant material that you're going to eat. So herbicides really should not be used, uh, even though you want to get rid of the weeds. Please don't do it in your vegetable garden. Next slide, please. So that's the weeds. I think you've got a few tips there about how you're going to handle them. Now we're going to move on to insects. I have to confess, when I was small, I thought, I assumed, except for spiders, my mother always said, don't ever kill a spider. Paula, they're really uh, very good uh, insects in the garden. I had no idea why, but uh, she of course knew all about those things, so I didn't know. 
but I assumed every other insect was not a good thing. So I thought that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of insect pests. Surprise, surprise, when I really started learning more about horticulture and gardening, I discovered actually in the insect world, the pests are way outnumbered by the beneficial, the, the ones that we humans say are good for our gardens. So isn't that wonderful? Only one to 3% of a million known species of insects are what we call pests. So uh, the bottom line there is really important. If, if insects, in most, if most insects, insecticides are sprayed, they're going to kill more of your good bugs than the bad ones. So everything you can do to avoid spraying is really good. Now, having said that, I have to admit that in, at least in this part of the world, in, in the Shenandoah Valley, in, in um, Virginia, there are a lot of pests. I grew up gardening in England and I don't think back then we had nearly as many pests. We didn't seem to spray things, uh, but we have a lot of we have a lot of things. And some we do have to if we want a crop of some sorts, we do have to very judiciously, very carefully um, get at them. And that's what we're going to talk about. So. Um, Oh, by the way, I should have said these are damselflies, very pretty flies, and and though they tend to favour uh, wet, fairly wet gardens or bogs and that sort of thing, I have got them in my garden from time to time, and uh, they do nice work on aphids and small white fly and some of the small insects that we we don't really like very much. Next slide, please. So we've already learned that there are many, many, many more beneficial insects than pests. Next slide, please. So what do we do to encourage them? Well, it's really simple and lovely, and I didn't really do it with enough vigor uh, until relatively recently. You plant in amongst your vegetables, native flowers, that will attract these good insects that will really aid you no end. They, we have insects that devour aphids. We have insects that don't like white fly and black fly. Um, and, and so, and of course they are pollinators. So they're helping your flowers pollinate and, and grow you beautiful fruit, peas and beans and, and uh, tomatoes and so on. So, the beneficial insects are much to be encouraged. Don't just assume that somehow they'll come. Uh, I did not know this for years. And then gradually I realized that, you know, having some marigolds in there and some nasturtiums was a good idea. I don't think I really realized till two or three years ago that I should really have lots of flowers all mixed in with my vegetables. And I should know because the English have always had cottage gardens with the two things all mixed up. And it's, it's very, very attractive and beautiful. So that's, that's the thing to do is to grow as many native flowers as you can in amongst your garden. Okay, there are a lot of insect pests, even though we say it's only one to 3% of, of all the insects. But the good thing is that the insects tend to be attracted to specific uh, varieties or families of vegetables and not at all to others. For example, um, I think we've all seen the white butterfly that flutters around in the garden, the cabbage white, which loves brassicas of all kinds and is, does devastating work if you let them. And here's a picture. <laughs> here's a picture right here of, a, of, of the cabbage white butterfly uh, on a cabbage. And it, it uh, devours big holes in those cabbage leaves and really makes it quite, can be, unsightly and, and you don't even want to eat the, what's left of the cabbage. So, um, but the interesting thing is that the cabbage white and its larvae, they don't eat beans, they don't eat rhubarb, they don't eat other things, but they love the brassicas, the bro broccolis and the cauliflowers and the Brussels sprouts and the cabbages. So the suggestion I have, especially for those who are perhaps beginning in gardening is Think about, or if you want to learn 
learn about the particular pests that go for the, the vegetables that you are growing or the fruits that you are growing. Don't try and cover the whole world of insect pests because I think it's a bit overwhelming. It is for me. Um, so uh, it is a comfort to me that in fact, uh, once you get to know your pests, uh, you can just add a little bit to your knowledge as you go along. You don't have to learn it all at once. Next slide, please. So what I've been, what we haven't got there yet, actions against insect pe pests. So, oh, this is interesting. Hmm. Paula, I think that, that it's just showing up a little slow for you. Sonia's getting it up as soon as you say. So I think you can go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, you've already heard me. The first action that we take when we think we're going to have insect pests um, is to, before you even see an insect, of course, is to, oh, well, you'll see insects, but before you've even started your garden is to plan to attract those beneficial insects with suitable flower, uh, plant, pollinated plants. You will find that your um, young plants need particular protection and you're going to hear more about that later about protecting from insect damage. Um, the, the stronger, the better you grow your plants, the sturdier they are, the more they will resist serious damage for, even from insects. Um, even in a, something of an in, infestation. It's the baby ones, it's the young ones, it's the new foliage at the tips of the branches that, that tend, are most succulent for those insects. Other early action, uh, some people feel squeamish about this, but you get used to it. Um, and picking um, beetles and bugs early in the morning when they're still sort of half sleepy. Uh, I go out with a basin of soapy water, just a, a, a spot of dawn or some soap. And I also put a splash of Clorox in it because if, for example, you're collecting stink bugs, that can get very unpleasant smell. So if you have a splash of chlorine, it's wonderful. It nullifies the smell and you can use that uh, basin of water for more than one, one morning. Um, I mentioned uh, Mexican bean beetle egg masses because those are, do hatch to be an awful lot of beetles on your cucumbers and, and uh, not cucumbers, excuse me, beans on, on uh, pole beans and bush beans. So if you see those, what I do is I actually carefully snip away a, a little bit of the leaf that has the egg mass on it. It's a flat yellow little thing. You can look it up and always look things up all the time in, in uh, Google and so on. And uh, if you can get rid of the eggs, you, you really save yourself a lot of beetles. So that's, that's really helpful. Next slide, please. Yes, it is interesting. Yes, okay. This, the, the, um, here's, here's a very mild way of getting rid of slugs. You can see these slugs all lined up on a saucer, which is filled with really some old beer uh, at a level with the soil and the slugs really do go after the beer. Um, and again, the least damaging pesticide you can use, and certainly I, we encourage, we always encourage organic pesticides and the correct timing. If you try to use something like Bt, um, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, I don't know how to pronounce it, Bt, which is very effective against larvae. If you use it, however, when the larvae have formed themselves into their moth or their their butterfly or whatever it is, uh, <clears throat> alas, it's not going to hurt them at all. So it's a waste to use the BT at the wrong time. And so again, read the directions. Good labels will tell you uh, how to apply, how much to apply and when to apply. A few good organic uh, insecticides, if you really have to use them, uh, these are organic ones. Neem, which is made from the oil of an Indian tree Pyrethrins come from a particular kind of chrysanthemum. Iron sulfate is very effective for snails and slugs, and iron sulfate is nothing more than a, 
a mineral-based compound that is uh, quite innocuous to anything, anything else. It, it's fine. Um, I mentioned BT is very effective. I think dusting, <clears throat> uh, dusting your cabbage or kale and so on with BT will keep those uh, larvae at bay. And here's one that some of you may not have heard of, which is actually, it's not going to eradicate pests, insect pests, but it's going to really cut down the numbers dramatically enough that the plant can survive and in fact do very well. It's called, uh, it's a clay, it's very fine ground clay, like a dust, kaolin clay, and uh, the make is surround. And it's very good if any of you have tree fruits like apples or plums or whatever, it's very effective uh, for that. And also if you're worried about tomatoes being in too uh, sunny a spot, uh, hard to imagine, but, and they, and they start getting blistered and, and uh, if you then powder the, dust the, the fruit with surround, which is, as I say, completely um, doesn't hurt you at all. You can easily wash it off because it's a, it's a fine powder. So that deals with the insect pests. I hope that's helped a little bit. Now we'll go on to plant diseases of which there are so many. Next slide, please. This is like so much else I'm going to start, but prevention is best. I think it's very often very difficult to deal with a that has needed by a disease to a considerable extent. Prevention is best. You need to know that diseases, uh, plant diseases thrive where it's warm and moist. So this is why this particular picture says, please don't water your vegetable plants from the top because then and particularly if you do it after two o'clock in the afternoon, that moist is going to cling around through the night and the disease, <laughs> the diseases are going to have a lovely time growing their hearts out. So please, they don't have hearts, but um, so please don't try not to water from the top. Uh, the other thing, which I'm afraid I'm tempted, I'm often tempted to crowd some of my plants. I just want to put, those extra few plants in that raised bed because really I don't have, I, I'd rather have eight than six. But if you crowd your plants, what happens? You've got a little jungle there and the humid, the, underneath that jungle, underneath that panelty is a lovely, warm, humid, tropical climate <laughs> all through the night and, um, and the day, of course, as well. So it's much better to, to pay attention to what the seed packet tells you or the plant label, space out your plants, let the breeze blow through them and blow some of that humidity away. Prevention is so much better than trying to deal with the plant diseases. Next slide, please. So here are some common diseases which I will um, skip through because later on I have a few tips for some specific plants, which you may well be planting, because again, it's like, like the pests, these plant diseases favor certain families of plants and aren't on every plant. But unfortunately, there are many, many families of diseases. They're caused, as I say here, by fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes. We commonly call them, and you'll hear this, blights, wilts, and mildews. And uh, as I said, plant families can get specific diseases. Uh, tomatoes, we know, have, a, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, have, are, are likely to get several different kinds of diseases. We've got some strategies for them. Um, squash and cucumbers, everything in the cucurbit family uh, is prone to get mildew again. If you water those great big leaves <laughs> from the top, they're going to stay wet. Uh, for too long and the mildew is going to um, uh, spread and it's not desirable at all. This is actually a squash plant. It was one of mine several years ago. I haven't had mildew too lately. I don't know why it was, but I got a lot of mildew that year. Next, uh, next slide, please. 
So how are we going to prevent plant diseases? Because I said prevention is so much better than trying to cure. And the first thing I say is if you can rotate your crops, we've talked about this before, it is desirable, particularly two kinds of crops, tomatoes and that family, um, potatoes and peppers and so on, and, and also squash, which is difficult because they're such big plants. So rotating to a different part of the garden is, is a challenge. But if you can, it's desirable. If you can't, I really suggest, uh, because of the so soil-borne nature of the pathogens come into the soil and they, they winter over, they'll stay down there happily waiting to attack another plant. If you can put a barrier with the, with the newspaper and, and mulch or whatever, I think it, I find that that helps quite a lot. They infect the new, the pathogens just come up and infect the new plantings very quickly. In the fall, which is a long time from now, but it'll come soon enough, uh, clean your garden of disease debris. You don't necessarily have to take down plants if they've got seed heads and things that still the wildlife might like. But if you've got diseased uh, plants, get rid of them. Don't put them in your compost because they will thrive in your compost and be all ready to reinfect your new seedlings the next year. So you have to get rid of it some other way. And here's something that it's sometimes hard to do, but it is a good idea. To your garden tools, your scrub, your pots, um, scrub them at the end of the season and then rinse. And I use uh, one part of 10 by volume it, uh, bleach in water, very effective for uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning your, your tools and your, your pots and then you're all ready to go and you're not going to reinfect the seedlings the next year. Next slide please and the last one we are trying to deal with the challenges in our garden. I've got some tips here for some plants um, in the next slide. Here we go. Tomatoes, squash, beans, eggplants and cucumbers. Um, a lot of this we've already discussed, the rotating rot rotation of the crops of tomatoes, squash, and their families. Um, something I would like to mention to you is with tomatoes, is if you are having trouble with wilts and uh, diseases of your tomatoes, you may want to look into planting hybrid tomatoes that are resistant to some of these diseases. Now there's a whole alphabet soup of these diseases that tomatoes are prone. And I've got here just a few of the initials, V, F, F, N, T, A. And you will see, if you look in certain uh, garden catalogs, nursery catalogs, which are just wonderful, they will tell you all these different tomatoes that have resistance to the different blights and, and wilts. Um, and they just put the initials right, right there, right alongside how many days it takes to maturity or whatever you're reading. But I really think uh, that I have had to resort to uh, using some of these um, because some of the tomatoes do get the wilts quite badly in this area. Again, if you can protect your soil so that they, they don't splash up. Oh yes, that's the last one there. Prune the leaves 12 inches from up from the soil. When your tomato plants get a good size, maybe 18 to 24 inches, um, it is really worthwhile to nip off the bottom, uh, the bottom leaves from, that are near to the soil. Why? Because the rainwater will splash soil up onto those leaves and lo and behold, the pathogens get a good toehold onto your lower leaves. Even if you've got this, even if you've got the soil covered, it seems to me to be better to, to prune up those leaves um, from the soil. So and that's something that not everybody does, but I found it quite effective. But I do get the early blight and the late blight in my tomatoes very often. And though it doesn't damage the fruit, uh, it does cut out on some of the productivity. One thing here on squash I would like to mention, and that is missing the life cycle of the 
the bora, the squash bora, and the squash uh, beetle spugs. Um, if you plant your seeds late, uh, the plants won't come up before the, the larvae have already graduated to being the moths and whatever. So they, they, they're going to go hungry, and that's really a very good thing. I do plant my, my, my squash particularly um, as late as the end of June, actually, and I find that they don't seem to be much slower than people who planted them in May because they catch up. The soil is lovely and warm, and uh, it's, it's really very good. Beans, we've talked about uh, hand picking. Um, the eggplants here is eggplants seem to be extremely susceptible around here anyway to flea beetles which perforate the leaves and do the plants in if they're small. If you have fairly good sized eggplants, they seem to be able to withstand it and, and thrive. So I do not, I grow eggplants from seed, I leave them uh, indoors for much longer than I would like to have to. Um, but that's the way they, they do survive. So um, that by that, I am doing what I, I've done what I can to show you a little bit about dealing with uh, weeds and diseases and insects. I hope some of this has been helpful. And I'm passing you now, I think, back to Sonia. Yes, and I'm actually going to stop the share um, so that we can take some questions because that was a lot of information to cover and um, a lot of, there's been a lot of great comments in the chat, but I thought we would take a pause and see from the team if we've got anything in the Q&A that we should cover. Somebody had put in the chat, um, they were just concerned whether ants were a problem in the garden. But... I see ants on my peonies every single year. And I gather that they are after the honeydew, do they call it, of the, um, uh, of the aphids and so on. And I don't, I don't think that ants, I don't believe that they do any damage to plants. Any of my colleagues have any comment on that? That's my understanding too. They're kind of annoying because you get like big chunks of them and it seems like they're doing something wrong. <laughs> but I've not ever noticed any, any plant damage, so I kind of live and let live in that case. I'm in the same camp. I don't do anything about the ants uh, at all, uh, ever. I've never had a problem. Uh, as Paula said, they do go after aphids. So if you have aphids, you will have ants. Um, and they, the two just will show up together. The ants are looking for the aphids. Um, but uh, if you have a real ant problem, maybe you have also have a real aphid problem. Dealing with the aphid problem will minimize the amount of ants you have. Yes, good but point. But the good ants point. in and of themselves, I have not seen or heard that they are a problem in a garden. Somebody wanted a little more about the, how to put the foil collar around the plant. Uh, well, that's for, just for the squash. Um, and I don't actually do that anymore because I don't I don't have a borer problem, but I used to um, before I when I planted the, the squash early earlier. Um, and as I remember it, I just got foil and I um, I made a little indentation in the soil so that the foil would be underneath the soil and wrapped the and this is when the when the plants are quite young, by the way, you want to get them before before they're very immature. Um, and then I just put this foil around, all encircle the, the basic stem and dig, and it's down underneath the soil surface and just crimp it gently around the stem and leave it. And just like the, um, the other thing I do is with the tomatoes, I use the, oh, I didn't mention that, did I? The split uh, straw uh, because there you have a problem with cutworms, which is a different one from the squash. But I think I finished with the foil. I, I will mention this because it's quite good. Um, I people will tell you use cardboard toilet paper, you know, the cardboard rolls or plastic cups, and cut out the bottoms and put them around a collar around the tomato plant. 
I have found that if I've still got some plastic straws back for when I used to buy plastic straws, which I don't anymore, um, that I still have them and I recycle them so I don't waste them. And I find if I have about three to four inches or three inches <clears throat> length of straw, split it long, long wise, and then I can gently wrap it around the young tomato plant, again, burying it a little bit into the soil, maybe half an inch in. And it is absolutely uh, foolproof. No cutworm is going to get at the stem to, to ruin your beautiful little seedling. And you just leave it on. Why? Because the stem keeps growing and eventually it just pops it off. And it, because it's strong enough, it just pops it off. I quick save it, disinfect it, and say, use it again. So some of my straws are three or four years old. <laughs> so uh, I hope that helps. Somebody asked a question. Sylvia asked, what about four-legged pests? Rabbits and squirrels are extremely enthusiastic in my area. We're going to get to those next, actually. OK. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like so much protect, protect, protect. Yeah. <laughs> so Paula, your your comment about planting squash late has got a bunch of people thinking. Uh, yes. And the the question was, uh, you know, if you if you plant your pumpkins late in June, do you still get pumpkins? That's a good question because I I don't grow the only kind of pumpkins I grow the Jack B little the little the little tiny ones. And they are fine. They grow just just fine. The butternut squash is kind of slow, but everything speeds up because you know the soil temperature is really warmed up, mm -hmm. and so uh, it it goes faster. I don't have a problem now. I know pumpkins. I mean, a large pumpkin like a Halloween pumpkin probably needs as long as it possibly can. Uh, that's a very good question. Does anybody else grow pumpkin big pumpkins and know about? Uh, how to avoid, are they, are they very prone to the borers or how are they? Uh, I have tried pumpkins. They're very prone to the borers and they're very prone to all kinds of uh, powdery mildew and wilt and so on that uh, limits the uh, plant from really producing much. A uh, few times I've been successful with pumpkins uh, but I have to say, for the most part, I struggle with the diseases that they're prone to because I do all the things that you tell us not to do. And <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you have to. I have to confess. Sometimes you have to, but it breaks one's heart <laughs> to do that. I don't grow pumpkins, but um, I was talking to the team before we started that I found a type of squash from um, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, we talked about last time, uh, called it upper ground yes, sweet potato. And those um, have very thick stems. And so they're more resistant to borers and diseases. And, and, mm -hmm. and they, the, the, the squash that I got was enormous. It only was one and it bent the trellis. It was so huge. So I got an equivalent of a pumpkin, <laughs> which I wasn't <laughs> meaning to. That really was a very successful, um, after lots of struggles with borers. And, and I have found that if, I can, if I'm patient enough to wait and plant them later, that really Works. helps. So I tend to just go with stuff that's the gonna grow. Thing is maybe try, this, try, try the aluminum foil uh, around the, the stems when they're young. Yeah, I've had some success with that as well. So. I don't know about the mildew. That's, don't water them from the top, whatever you do. But I, unfortunately, I think most commercial pumpkin growers probably use a lot of pesticides, <sighs> you know? It's like roses are almost impossible to grow because of the black spot. <sighs> yeah, it's very difficult, very difficult. Well, maybe you know an organic nursery that grows pumpkins. Maybe that's the place to go and ask, <laughs> what do they really do? Have we asked, answered all the questions? No other questions? I just want to mention somebody in the chat said, I've had great luck with um, tiny pumpkins growing on lattice. I didn't know if they meant a flat lattice that they spread out or going up, but anyway, oh. I, I didn't know if that was a way to keep the pests away. Also, the spores come from the ground, of course, into the stems, so that mm -hmm. went. Uh, the beetles, hmm. 
I don't know. The Beatles. <laughs> they're everywhere. They around. <laughs> they're certainly those those Mexican bean beetles. If they're anything like them, they they are all over the pole beans, worse than even the, the bush beans, in my experience. That's just one person. I think we're ready to move on. Okay. Let me go back to my screen sharing here. One second. Okay. So we've talked about protecting from the cold last time and the, and the elements. We've talked a little bit about preventing and protecting from insects and blights. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about protecting from damage that might come from other sources, such as those critters <laughs> that people were asking about, um, or you know, high winds or other elements that could could damage your plants in the middle of the season. So, um, there are a couple of different options to um, to help protect your plants. Trellises, which there's a really great um, shot here of um, a bamboo, I guess trellis, um, great for vining items like squash or beans um, to keep them off the ground and keep them, you know, kind of moving in an upward direction. Um, cages, if you've got tomatoes, and tomatoes can also be done in a variety of ways. There are tomato cages you can get. You can build structures to, again, have your tomatoes um, supported. And um, I have found a lot of great use for bamboo. If, if <laughs> You folks like me have people around you who have lots of bamboo they're trying to get rid of and neighbors cutting down bamboo. Uh, you can get lots of great um, bamboo of varying shapes and sizes to be like thin pieces, thicker pieces to make like a teepee or a, a trellis structure. So um, it doesn't have to be something expensive. You can buy all kinds of fancy trellises. And if you want something that's going to be lasting year over year, you can buy those as well, but you can also DIY with a lot with bamboo in particular. Um, netting is great for um, keeping the birds off your fruit um, and also keeping, um, if you have more of a mesh netting, keeping um, pests away from your crops as well. Row covers are good for um, the early season to kind of warm things up, but also good for keeping the bugs away if you've got small seedlings and you want to protect them. As Paula mentioned, they're very fragile when they first get out there. So you want to try to protect them. And, and in some cases, um, some plants uh, like a little bit of shade. So row covers are good for that. Or you can also plant them next to something taller to shade them a little bit. So things that need a little bit of, of cooler um, weather and shade, you can sometimes extend the season. Um, and then <laughs> somebody was asking, I think, about squirrels. They're a menace and <laughs> there's not a whole lot you can do unless you've got a dog <laughs> to really keep them out of your yard. But um, I have found that hot pepper slows them down a little bit. Um, and coffee grounds also, they don't like the, the, the scent of that. Um, I, I learned recently that birds don't have taste buds. So the hot pepper is gonna keep them away. So <laughs> you might have birds digging in your, in your soil, um, but the hot pepper will keep the squirrels away. Um, I do not have, problems with rabbits or deer. So uh, I would open that up to thoughts from other folks who have had success trying to keep the deer away. And I know that the deer are, are tricky and they are encro we encroach on their territory. So they're, they're getting pushed into our spaces more and more frequently. So um, you can, you know, if you have a really tall fence, that is a great start. But um, Paul, I think you had mentioned something with uh, peanut butter. <laughs> you had a trick for deer. If you want to share that, that might be fun to hear. It sounds a little unkind, but it really <laughs> works. Uh, <clears throat> I have an electric fence and it's only uh, two or three strands. It's only about five foot tall. And uh, early in the season, I'll put some metal strips, um, aluminum foil strips wrapped um, take the turn the electricity off first, of course. <laughs> Uh, and I wrap them <laughs> at intervals around along the fence, uh, fairly far apart. And then I will take peanut butter and smear it on the end of the, the tab that's hanging down from the, from the uh, wire on the, on, the, on the aluminum foil. And then you turn the electricity on and then uh, the poor deer comes and has a nice lick and gets a, sh gets a shock right in its tongue. And that deters them. <laughs> it absolutely worked for me. Um, and uh, I have never, I mean, my, I mean, we, we have a lot of deer here. 
and uh, they avoid my vegetable garden beautifully. So try it, it's worth it, it's worth an experiment. Mm. And Bill mentioned um, surrounding yeah. the plants that they like with the plants they don't like. I've heard that onions um, work really well for that because they just don't like the, the smell of the taste. So that is something to try. <laughs> Well, the only other thing is that deer, if they're really hungry, they're going to yeah. do anything they can. Um, but, it, and, and, you know, we have a lot of deer. <laughs> <laughs> we do. And then the problem is only increasing as, again, we encroach on their habitat. So a lot of patience and again, a sense of humor <laughs> and sharing tips with your friends about what's worked for them is yes. a great way to, to, to spread the love. <laughs> All right. I... I'm going to pass this over to Deb to pick up with harvesting. If, assuming you've made it this far and your plants have made it this far, <laughs> there's good news ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks. You, you, you stole my opening line. <laughs> so as, assuming that we get through all the pests and the diseases, uh, and, and I think every farmer uh, goes through all of this pain and agony to get to the harvest. This is what we're waiting for. Um, mm -hmm. And the typical question is, can I pick it now? Can I pick it now? Well, if you read your seed packet, it'll tell you days to maturity. So you have uh, a, at least a guideline of when you should be able to reach uh, a good size fruit. And what you're gonna look for is um, a, a, just a, a good size, a good, a good quality uh, vegetable or a leaf you know, depending, the picture I have here has an eggplant and a pepper, some radishes and some herbs and a little bit of lettuce in the background there, kale, I think in the middle. But um, you want it to look healthy. You want it to look crisp. You want it to be a uh, uh, firm fruit. You don't want to have it uh, squishy or, uh, you know, allow it too long to where this, the skin of the fruit starts to get wrinkly. Um, so that's what you're looking for when you're you're ready to pick um, but the seed packet really has the information you need that'll tell you about when your your fruit is your vegetable is going to be ready for picking um if i will say if it has blemishes on it pick it uh oftentimes they'll be starting to rot they'll have a bug bite that will start to cause a problem with the fruit and so if it looks diseased at all pick it and get rid of it. Uh, if it's got some, you know, like half your tomato is gone, it's probably going to rot the whole tomato. Just get it out of there. Um, and, and don't compost it if it looks like it's diseased. Mm -hmm. So the best time of the day to harvest is in the morning. And I say this judiciously, not all of us can get out at the, uh, at the uh, garden every day, but you want to pick it in the morning when it's uh, drier, you don't wanna be out there when it's wet and gushy, you don't wanna be about picking in the rain. The problems that Paula was talking about with the diseases, you don't want to spread them from one plant to another as your hands touch everything. Um, so you, you do wanna pick them in the morning. They'll have sucked up some moisture overnight, making them a little plumper. The sun will come up and dry them and they'll lose some of that moisture. So picking them up in the morning you're gonna get a much juicier, much more flavorful um, plant, whatever it is that you're picking. Um, but that's really the best way to, to figure out when. And picking more frequently. The, if, if you're gonna get a little bit of handful of beans today and next, tomorrow you're gonna to get another little handful of this and another little handful of that, uh, you'll cause the plant to hopefully continue to pr produce longer. It's like deadheading your flowers that you've taken the, the object off and it goes, oh, I got to grow more, um, which is a nice thing to do. Now, how do you use your harvest? The first thing I'm going to tell you is before you plan your plants, plan how you're going to eat them. If you're going to plant kale, make sure you know how to use kale. If you're going to plant chard, make sure you know how to use Swiss chard. If you're going to plant radishes, Make sure your family likes them. Very hard to use and eat things that your family does not like to eat. And there are a lot of ways, recipes, things to do, ways to use the various herbs. But this is something that you've got to start thinking about 
at the planning stage so that when you get to a harvest, you already know, oh, I want to make zucchini fritters. Oh, I'm going to shred and put away some of my zucchini in the freezer so I can make zucchini bread this Christmas. Um, I am going to slice up my extra hot peppers and put them in the freezer so that I can just dump them in the pot when I'm ready to make something that needs a hot pepper. Um, I do that for my madras lentils, by the way. I take my jalapeno peppers and I chop them up and put them in little containers that is the exact size I need for uh, a recipe of uh, madras lentils. And so you can think ahead this way, um, but there's so many dishes that you can do. Uh, typically we're planting tomatoes and we're planting um, cucumbers. There's a lot of fresh salads that you can make. There's all kinds of pickles that you can make and they don't require canning. You can put them in the freezer or you can put them in the refrigerator. Uh, and, and eating fresh is just so wonderful. But when your harvest is huge, you have to know what else you can do with these things. Um, and uh, I planted eggplant for the first time this past year. And I have to honestly say, I did not follow my own advice and figure out what I was gonna do with it ahead of time. And a couple of them spoiled in the refrigerator because I kept thinking, oh, I got to do something with that eggplant. I don't know what to do with eggplant. And I would have this little mental argument with myself and the eggplant never got eaten. Uh, <laughs> so so I can I can tell you, honestly, thinking ahead when you're planning something with this, I'm going to make this with this. I'm going to make this. I can use this thing in two or three different recipes. And that way you'll have a plan, a game plan for when the things come in. And don't be afraid of having a bad harvest. That happens sometimes. There are times when I've planted something and literally got nothing out of it for various reasons. Uh, you know, it was too hot, it was too wet, it was, uh, you know, uh, overcome by uh, disease mm -hmm. or uh, whatever. But there are, there are failures and sometimes there are just some things that you can't grow um, before the uh, session started tonight, Paul and I were talking about uh, rhubarb because I managed to kill all my rhubarb. And I don't know why I've planted it three or four different times, but I really think it's the soil that I'm putting it in. It's not nutritious enough. So uh, it's outside my garden um, in a shaded area, which I thought would be good, but I just really think the soil wasn't nutritious enough. So I've got to amend my soil now and I'll try it again probably next year after I've done a, a lot of amendments with uh, compost and, and manure to be prepared for that. So then you have to come to saving your harvest. And as I mentioned, you can freeze things, you can dry things. Um, dried tomatoes, I have to tell you, work great in a lot of recipes. Uh, you can preserve your herbs in oils or ice. You can freeze pickles, and I never knew you could freeze pickles before because I've always canned pickles, but I have a recipe now that is for freezers, and you take it out in the middle of the winter, and you think you're back in the summertime because they're just so fresh tasting. They didn't get heated up and canned. They were just frozen fresh from the, the vine and just phenomenal. So you can freeze or chop. You can dry. You can, um, beans are especially good for drying. Lima beans, if you remember from my first session, I talked about my lima beans from being my favorite and they're great fresh and they're great dried. So again, as you're planning, think about how you're gonna store and save your harvest and how you're gonna use it. Um, and, and Maybe when I talk about using your harvest, I should also put a byline in there as how to get all your friends to take some extra zucchini. But uh, actually there's just so much that you can do with the zucchini. We use it in soups, uh, we can it, we freeze it, we use it in breads um, and fritters. I will tell you zucchini fritters are absolutely delicious. Can I get the next slide please? Um, so succession planning. Once you harvested one plant, you may be able to plant another plant after it. And I'm gonna say, this is one time when reading your packets is really, really helpful. Um, if you look at the, the uh, 
snap key on the bottom left there, it it gives you information about it and it tells you things like um, what season is. Do you plant it in the cold? Do you plant it in the heat? Uh, it tells you how long it takes to mature. It tells you, uh, like with bok choy, you can harvest it early. You can harvest it when you have a little bok choy. You can harvest it when you have a little bit larger bok choy. Once you harvest that, you could plant something else in its place. You could plant the kale. You could plant something else because that's going to come out fairly early in the season. Um, it even tells you how many days it takes to uh, get to grow. So when, when are you going to see those seeds coming out of the ground? Um, how, how to space it. And then you can maybe put in a, a flower in between. You could maybe put in a pea beside it and your pea will go up the trellis and the bok choy will be below. If you're not crowding them too tightly, you can get a couple more uh, plants in there. But it's, um, it's really, really important to read your packets. Um, and, and that is part of your succession planning. I do peas very early in the year for where I am. They do well if I plant them in the very beginning of March and keep, they will be gone in typically about 60 days. And by that time, I can start planting something else in that space. Um, by then we're at the end of April, early May. It's it has to be something that's still fairly cold tolerant because May is a kind of a dicey month. Um, typically, you don't want to go past um, or plant too much before the middle of May for our area. But as I said, reading the packets, knowing how long it's going to take to get to your maturity date and how long it's going to take um, before you can you know, harvest will tell you what you can plant next. And Paula will later have some calendar items for us so that you can kind of get an idea. Okay, well, my sugar peas or my bok choy are going to be done by this time. And according to the calendar for my zone, I can do this as my next plant. And um, it keeps your garden growing all year long and producing and uh, probably too early to talk about fall plantings, but there's even things that you can plant late in the fall that you can have growing through the late fall and even through the winter. And, and that's kind of a fun thing. Um, but packets, I believe in reading packets. So next slide, please. Seed saving. Um, I am a dyed in the wool seed saver. And the reason that you would save seeds is because you could grow a particular variety that you like. You have a tomato that your family just dearly loves and you got it from a friend. Well, if you want to have that same tomato again, you want to save those seeds um, and then grow some more. So you also can save some money. Some of these seeds can be quite pricey. If you have a specific variety or type that you like that does well in your area, but it's expensive to buy the seed. By saving your own seeds, you can save yourself money and you can keep that same plant. Um, fun fact that I didn't really know and understand is if you plant a specific plant in your area and it does well for you and you really like it, it will learn about your soil and your environment and you plant, plant the children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, it will learn about what diseases are around. It will learn about what pests you have and it plants can be adaptable to the environment the longer they are grown in that specific environment. So they're, they're combating um, for their own lives and that helps you as you save those seeds and replant the same ones again. And you can select for traits that you like and build for disease resistance that way especially important if you like particular tastes and colors of the plants that you've gotten and you might not be able to find it again. I grew an absolutely phenomenal, uh, basically an English cucumber, very, very low seeds, and I've never, ever found it again, that exact same variety. I don't know what it was, 
It was delicious. I didn't save any of the seeds because I figured I'd be able to find it again. Mm -mm, can't find it anywhere. So very important mm -hmm. reasons to save your seeds. So what do you do with these seeds you want to save? If it's a dry item like a bean, you just can leave the whole pod together and allow it to dry for several weeks until it's nice and crisply dried. And then uh, you can even save it like that, or you can pop the little seeds out of the pod and let them dry completely and save them that way. If it's something like a tomato, which is gushy, you want to wait until it's fully ripe and the skin is a little bit squishy, maybe a little wrinkly, it's fully ripe, then you're going to take that, scrape out the seeds with that little gelatinous stuff in there and put it in a jar with some water and just shake it up every once in a while for a couple of days. You're going to be shaking it up to try to separate the seeds from that pulpy stuff. And over a couple of days of you shaking it, they'll eventually uh, kind of separate. You can strain it out and then you separate out the seeds and put them on um, Typically, they tell you paper towel, but I use newspaper because I don't like to use paper towels like that. And um, then let those dry and then save the dry seeds. And we'll talk about uh, on my next slide, we're going to talk about how to store your seeds once you've gotten them dried. Um, but that's what you do for those soft, fleshy types of vegetables. And um, then if it's a seed head where you've got a little dry brown seed head you want to make sure that you're taking your best plants don't take your disease plants don't take the moldy plants don't take the plants that have had issues you want to take the healthiest ones you have say a dill and you want to let it go and it's dry and once that head is dry then you take the whole head off and you can either save the whole deal head like it is or you can let it dry a little bit in the house and just, just use your hands to kind of scrape off the pieces of the seeds and save those. Uh, I save a lot of my seeds. I even have um, seeds that I have picked up from all over the US that I have tried to grow here. Uh, and I even keep bags, uh, plastic bags in my car, Ziploc bags, you know, that kind of a thing multiple different kinds like that and if i see a seed that i like uh, i'll snatch some of it um if it's a friend's house i usually ask if it's in the wild i don't <laughs> but uh i love i love saving seeds so that's one of my things um but be sure absolutely be sure to not pick seeds from diseased plants moldy plants anything like that and always 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 make sure that you've dried them well so next slide, please. So here you get to see a couple of my bags of seeds that I saved. Um, at the time I collected these, I wrote down really quickly what it was uh, in the bag. I generally keep the Ziploc bag zipped tight until I get home because I don't want to spill a seed in my car. Um, and then I open it to let it dry out if they're not fully dry. Sometimes I'll even put them out on paper to get them to dry out a little bit more. And then I'm going to transfer them to a packet, usually a little envelope. I'll reuse old bill envelopes because you could write more information on them than those little tiny manila ones that you have to purchase. So. Uh, and, and I write down as much as I can when I collected it, what it is, um, anything that I might know about growing it in the environment. And that's if I'm wild collecting seeds. Now, if it's seeds from my garden, I planted this specific tomato this year and I'm saving those specific seeds. I have my old packet and I can say, this is a blah, blah, blah tomato. It's 65 days to maturity. It likes, you know, whatever. And um, I can give some idea of what I know about the plant based on reading that previous packet. Um, so then that's how I collect my seeds. And I will um, watch for seeds that I like. And um, a lot of times you can go to um, 
like I said, your friend's houses or a plant or seed swap, and you'll get a seed that you're not quite sure how it grows. With those, I will generally try to do uh, an experiment in a pot. Does the seed grow at all? Can I grow it? Um, so I get an idea. And, and that helps me as I'm marking and, and reusing my seeds. <clears throat> and believe it or not, you can keep seeds for years. Um, I came across a, a, a link to an article on, and it had a whole list of how long various seeds work. And tomato seeds are phenomenal. You can keep those for five, six, seven years and they'll continue to grow. Um, and when you've had a seed and it's been around for a long time and you don't know if it's gonna grow, uh, you can do a germination test. And that was covered in our second set. Uh, so germination tests are really helpful um, if you don't know how something is gonna grow. But the more you're able to write down about your seeds and save that information, uh, it, it's better. So next slide, please. This is about seed storage. This is a box. Uh, it's a Tupperware box that I keep in my basement. And uh, I have them separated by what are vegetables, what are herbs, and uh, even some that are uh, medicinal herbs off to one side. And they're in these little packets um, for the most part. And some of them are in the original packets or back in the same packet from what I got them from in the first place. And um, I do suggest that you put these, some people will put them in a cardboard box. Uh, if you're like um, Sonia and you have mice in your basement, that's not a good space to, to put them in because <laughs> the mice will get into the cardboard box. But if you put them in a, a Tupperware box that has a really tight lid, that's best. It's uh, gonna keep them from insects, it's gonna keep them from mice, and um, it'll keep them from retaining moisture because you don't want them to bring in more moisture. You can put them in the refrigerator, and some people will say that the refrigerator is best, but most refrigerators, they will gain moisture from them. So I suggest if you're gonna save a couple of seeds in your refrigerator, put them separately in the little paper packets, put them in a jar that you're closing off tight so that they don't pull in moisture. Um, but because that's gonna be what will cause them to mold and die. So you wanna think about, they need to be in a consistent temperature. They suggest 32 to 41 degrees. Um, but I find that my basement does just fine. I have a cold, dark uh, storage area in the basement. It doesn't get heat and uh, the Tupperware keeps it, the Tupperware type bins keep it really nice and safe. And that's generally what I keep mine in. But they're just in the little paper packets and um, it, it does, they have, I've got seeds from 2017 that are still growing. So I can't complain about that. But cool and dark, away from heat, away from moisture, uh, it's good if they're in that paper packet because that helps them stay dry. And sometimes I'll even throw uh, little containers of the desiccant. You'll sometimes get them in your shoe boxes or you get them inside your purse if you buy a new purse or, or even in the bottles of your supplements that you buy from the store. Those little desiccant packets, you can throw those in with your seeds and that'll help reduce the amount of uh, moisture in the air for them. And, and that's kind of a, a way to help them stay uh, from, it helps them keep from molding. That's what you're really trying to do is help them keep from molding. Um, but anyway, uh, seed saving is very exciting. If you try to save seeds, um, I will suggest that you don't save seeds from uh, plants that have male and female flowers. Uh, that would be like your squashes. They have male and female flowers. And if you're growing um, a, a watermelon and a muskmelon at the same time, they may cross pollinate and it won't hurt the fruit that you harvest that year. But if you try to grow from the seeds, you're going to get a hybrid. If you also take seeds from uh, a, a specific variety that is a hybrid, 
and they sometimes refer to them F1 varieties. If you do that, that's also a hybridized uh, plant. It will not grow true to seed. You can still grow it. You don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes it's a oops. Sometimes it's a good thing, but it it is uh, it's a pig in a poke. You just don't know what you're going to get if you're trying to uh, take seeds from something that was a hybrid. Um, so those are things to be aware of for saving seeds initially. Um, I think I covered everything on my slides. So I could take some questions. Shall I, since we're running out of time a bit, shall I just quick gallop through the calendars? Yeah. We're running out of time, go ahead. Yeah, we're short we on time. I want to say that there's been a wonderful little conversation going on in the chat about tips for marking with Sharpie and other types of containers and things like that. So that's been a, a fun little side channel going on. Um, oh, neat. I'll have to read the chat later. Yeah. So go ahead, Paula. I am very pleased that um, the two months of calendar, April and May, have been made into a handout which I think they're going to post on the chat so that anybody that is interested can in fact print it out and keep it for themselves. So I am not going to uh, laboriously <laughs> go through this. A lot of it is uh, repetitious of what we've already talked about. However, let me just make a comment that um, the very first thing on both of these months, April and May, is the soil temperature. I, I went out this morning and checked my soil temperature. Of course, you had a couple of warm days, uh, but the soil temperature is in March already 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's very promising indeed, but we're going to have cold days now. So there will be some fluctuation, but I doubt that the soil is going to get much below 45 now. It's probably, you know, it's well insulated. Um, here you've got the seeds to start, the plants to start. Um, and, and a few things in April. Um, going on to May, please, and the next slide. Sorry, one second. It's okay. I do want I, to uh, reinforce the fact that this, these, these uh, months are really very approximate. There are only certain things that uh, we have talked about in this series. You will want to do your own calendar, but this might give you at least a, a start on thinking about things to do in the garden by month. Again, if you are in Australia or British Columbia or uh, Florida or wherever some of you are, uh, your, your dates have to be adjusted. But even then, remember the climate, uh, the, the, temp the temperatures vary so much from year to year, from month to month. And, uh, and of course, there's microclimates as well in your garden, as opposed to even one down the road. So uh, a lot of this is just a guidance and uh, just to help you a little bit. Here in May, uh, at least in the Shenandoah Valley, we would hope to have soil temperatures um, equal to or above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, getting to be very nice germination temperatures indeed. And here you've got some uh, starting seeds. You can start some of your flowers now very well. You'd like to heard about uh, those things um, and planting outside and things to watch. Uh, one thing I will mention, um, for those of you who are going to have gardens in containers, May you must start watching that your pots are remaining nice and moist, the soil is remaining in your pots, remaining moist. Remember that moisture uh, is, is, it escapes very quickly from small containers. And that's even true for raised beds compared to an in-ground garden. So maintain your moisture. Again, I would warn you what we said before, if you're planting seeds and alas, they dry out before they've germinated, the seed is dead. It's not going to, it's not going to germinate later. You have to keep seeds moist all the way till ger germination. So with that, I hope that these, uh, these months will be just wonderful for everybody that's with us. It has been such a pleasure to be with you. And maybe we'll see you later on in um, preservation for Perplex. That will be fun. Thank you. 
thanks everyone for hanging in there with us and especially for those of us who've been with the, through all three sessions we hope that you've learned lots there's been lots of great tips shared um we can go ahead and put the the our final poll up to uh get some feedback as uh, people are heading out but again please do join us on facebook um check out our website for upcoming info um, there's actually information in there about becoming a member. If you want to support events like this, we count on your generous donations to keep providing lots of great info like this. And we will increasingly be doing in-person events as well as continuing to do webinars. So uh, check out upcoming events on our site, check out the membership options. If you'd like to volunteer, there's a, a form you can fill out on the site as well. Join us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, you will be getting this video um, and the chat log um, in via email, Ben, as we mentioned, the, um, the videos are also going to be up on Facebook and um, will eventually be put on YouTube in a final format. So if you'd like to continue to share, we encourage you to do so. Sharing is caring. And this information um, is meant to be put out there and distributed for folks to, to benefit from. So please do tell your friends. And we hope that we will see you back here for, for more information and perhaps even see you in person at one of these upcoming events.